Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you this morning as we move into Thanksgiving season, closely followed by Christmas here at Crawford Baptist Church. It won't be long, and uh, it's good to see you this morning. As we gather to study God's Word today, uh, I want to invite you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 34. So if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, if you'll turn to Genesis chapter 34, Genesis chapter 34. This will be our second message from this chapter. And last week we did not get to conclude it, but we're going to do that this morning, Lord willing. And the next couple of weeks we're going to be in Genesis 35, Genesis 36. Then we will break for our Christmas series and we'll resume uh, after the holidays back in the book of Genesis. It's going to be good as we finish out the book of Genesis early next year. This morning, Genesis chapter 34, I'm going to read God's Word to us. And as we did last week, I'm going to go ahead and read the chapter and set the stage. It's very important you understand uh, what's happening in this, this chapter. So please follow along in your Bible. If you need a Bible, there should be one in the seat uh, rack under the chair in front of you. Feel free to follow along in God's Word. Genesis chapter 34. The Word of God says this, Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this girl for my wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they heard of it. And the men were indignant and were very angry because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter for such a thing must not be done. But Hamor spoke with them saying, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter Please give her to him to be his wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us and the land shall be open to you. Dwell and trade in it and get property in it. Shechem also said to her father um, and to her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes and whatever you say to me I will give. Ask me for as great a bride price and gift as you will, and I will give whatever you say to me. Only give me the young woman to be my wife. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully, because he had defiled their sister Dinah. They said to them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to ourselves, and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. Their words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem. And the young man did not delay to do the thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most honored of all his father's house. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Let them dwell in the land and trade in it. For behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men agree to dwell with us to become one people. When every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised, will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate of his, of, the city, of his city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. On the third day, when they were sore, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. 
They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field. All their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in the houses, they captured and plundered. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, Should he treat our sister like a prostitute? Let me pray. And we will dive into this text today. Father in heaven, we do bow before you this morning. We thank you for the privilege of singing praises to heaven's king. And Father, we ask now that you help us as we study your word to hear with a clear voice the teaching of the spirit from this text to us today. Oh God, I I desperately need your help in this moment of preaching. Father, we need your help in hearing clearly and obediently from your word. And so, Lord, would you open our eyes and transform our hearts. We pray that you would save people. We pray, God, that you would would wake people up that may have stalled out in their walk with Christ. And that today would be a day when they would begin that walk anew and afresh today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you'll keep the Word of God open, and as we continue, this is sermon number 40. Sermon number 40 today in our series through the book of Genesis. And you need to remember that Genesis chapter 34 uh, is a warning to the generation of Israelites preparing to enter into the promised land. And God, through the pen of Moses, is warning them of the allurements of the world, the temptation to compromise the holiness and justice of God. He is warning them about the certainty of the wicked that that certainly is within their hearts even to this day and their tendency to use religion uh, as a facade for selfish intentions. You see, the same blood that flowed through the veins of their forefathers also flowed through their veins as well. And unless they uh, cast themselves upon the, the mercies and the promises of God, they would end up just as treacherous as had their forefathers. But this is not a warning just to the Israelites preparing to enter the promised land. This is the word of God. It lives and abides forever. And and the living word of God is a warning to you and me today of human sinfulness in our hearts. We may be the covenant people of God, but we too have sin within us. And if left to ourselves, we are capable of committing any sin and abomination known to man. We must rely completely upon the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as he is the one who brings us into the blessings that God had promised to the nations through the patriarchs. If we want forgiveness, if we want life, if we want reconciliation, if we want joyful hope, then we must find it in and through that one ultimate descendant of Abraham, his seed, Jesus Christ. You see, if the Lord left us to ourselves, then we would be no different than those Israelites of old, and there would be no end to the treachery that's within our hearts. I want to speak today on the topic, God's remedy for treacherous hearts. God's remedy for treacherous hearts. We began last week looking at point number one. There is no hope in Jacob. All right? There is no hope in Jacob. If you'll recall, back in Genesis 33, Jacob met Esau after having been away for 20 years. They hugged and they wept and and they reconciled, if you uh, would. And then Esau says, come on home to where I live, brother. There's plenty of room for you in Mount Seir. And Jacob says, brother Esau, I'll be there. But look, I'm going to take my time. I've got youngins and they can't move that swiftly. I have a lot of cattle and stuff. I have herds and flocks and they can't move that quickly. So I'll come to you at Mount Seir, just let me come at my own pace, but I will come and and hook up with you. That's what Jacob promised his brother back in chapter 33. Jacob never, ever went to Mount Seir. You see, we see patterns of Jacob's old deceptive behavior begin to arise once again within him. In fact, not only did Jacob not go to Mount Seir as he promised Esau, 
Neither did he go to Bethel, which is where God had called him to go. And something we all need to hear this morning in this room is you and I need to go where God calls us to go. We need to be right where God would have us. Jacob stopped short in his pilgrimage. And Dr. Derek Kidner said this, By halting his own pilgrimage, Jacob was endangering others more vulnerable than himself. Here's what Dr. Kidner is saying. By Jacob being disobedient to the Lord, he was endangering people who were very vulnerable more vulnerable than himself even. And that's where we had the question addressed that was introduced last week. Could the same happen with us who, rather than moving forward in faithfulness, obedience, and growth in Christ, passively content ourselves with staying where we are in our pilgrimage? Have we stalled out in our journey to Bethel, in other words? Could our neglect of our spiritual growth and laziness in the spiritual disciplines and procrastination with our obedience to the Lord affect those with whom we are vitally connected, like our family and our church? And the answer is absolutely yes. We can affect those around us by our passiveness, by our disobedience, by our rebellion to the will of God for our lives. We do affect others. Our own spiritual neglect, our own spiritual apathy, all right, have consequences beyond ourselves. We were discussing in a community group today in the Gospel Project lesson in the group that I was able to fill in for today, how that we teach by how we live. See, we can teach our kids it's important to worship God, love God, serve God, sing to God, give to God, and do all of these things. And yet, if we so live our lives to minimize, for example, the Christian Sabbath, the Lord's Day, then we are teaching them through our actions more loudly than we are through our words. How do we handle, how do we treat the Lord's Day, the Christian Sabbath? We communicate loudly through how we live. We also communicate loudly by the fact that uh, if we fail in family worship in our homes, we're not truly countering the spirit of this age. You see, Sunday morning worship is awesome. It's essential. We believe here at Crawford Baptist Church in the 5G life God time daily, right? Uh, Gather time, group time, give time, and go time. We believe in the 5G life here at Crawford Baptist Church. We do. We believe it. We teach it. But are we living it? You see, we're to have that God time daily. And as a part of God time daily, as a dad, I have the responsibility of leading my family in worship, reading the Bible to them praying with them and for them and teaching them to pray. This is every father's duty, you see. And when we fail to do that, when we, when we teach them how to swing the bat, hit the ball, uh, swing the club, change the oil, fix the tire, check the engine, when we do all of these things, how to mix up the recipe, how to find the sales that are going on, those are all wonderful things that can be taught, how to hunt, how to fish. All of these things are fine and wonderful. The problem is when we never, ever uh, teach them about God. And every dad is indeed pastor dad in his home. And we have a responsibility to teach our children in our homes. And overall, as a church in America today, listen, we are failing in that. It is not the community group teacher's job to train your child in godliness and Christlikeness. It is not the student pastor's responsibility that your daughter get saved. That is your responsibility. That is, that's, that's dad and mom's responsibility. Now, well, what, what's that community group teacher? Can't we just sleep in then? Well, no, because you're supposed to lead them into small group. We believe in group time. We believe in gather time. 
And, and, and we need a recovery. We need some repentance. And we need a recovery of understanding that, that when we were singing a moment ago, we aren't just singing words into the air, right? No, we're singing to a God who is watching you and listening to you as you worship Him. Worship is not a passive sport. Worship is an activity. It's of the heart. It's you're setting your mind's attention and your heart's affection upon the one true God. And we're praising him for who he is and what he has done in and through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so our spiritual neglect, I try to tell my children, and I'm not overly consistent, but I'm trying to be. I try to say, stand up, sing. He's worthy of that. Stand up and sing, Daniel Paul. Stand up and sing, Mary Grace. Don't be writing notes with your friends. Don't be, you know, looking around at everybody else. Worship God. He cares what you are doing in this room in this moment. And we oftentimes seem to forget our own spiritual neglect and apathy do have consequences beyond ourselves and on those whom we love and care for the most. Jacob failed to go where God called him to go, but Jacob also failed to practice uh, distinctiveness as the people of God. And we see that he was living among the Canaanites, and he bought land among the Canaanites, and his family was apparently worshiping the false idols of the Canaanites. We see that uh, in, in, in chapter 33, 19 to 20, and in verses there in chapter 34. I mean, his own sons say, hey, hey, if y'all will get circumcised, we'll, we'll intermarry with y'all. We'll become one people. That's a threat. God's people are to stand out like a diamond in a coal mine. We are to be different. We are different. In Christ, listen, in Christ, you're already different. The problem with many in our churches is they aren't in Christ, and therefore they are not different. Your name may be on the Crawford roll, but it's not on the Lamb's Book of Life, and that is the role that really counts. And so, you see, you are, if you have been saved, you are different. You have a spiritual appetite for God. We don't have to, for, it's not like taking castor oil or eating black licorice to read the Bible if you're a Christian. The problem is goats don't like the green grazing of Scripture, you see. And so you have to have a transformed heart. And so if you're hard-hearted toward God and you reject the Word of God as we had in our lesson today, then that leads to God's judgment upon you. And that's what was happening with Jacob. You see, partial obedience is actually total disobedience. And Jacob knew this was happening, but apparently he didn't take any steps to stop this. He did nothing about it since they were living among an idolatrous people. They were beginning to adopt idolatrous ways. Just over time, they became like the people around them. And listen, the Word of God in 1 Peter chapter 1 tells us to be holy because the Lord our God is holy. And again, there are people in this room today who have one foot in the church and one foot in the world, and you have more weight leaning on the foot that's in the world than the one that's in the church. And that leads you to be miserable. You do not enjoy reading the Bible. You don't enjoy community group. You don't mind if you miss worship service. If you miss a ball practice, you're all up about that one. But you can miss church for a month and it don't bother you. As long as I get the big one with the most points, I'm cool. You see, godly people, people who have been regenerated have hearts for God. And you're going to long for God and the people of God. Jacob was failing in these areas. He, he lost the distinctiveness of being a, 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 a man of God. He, 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 he did not go where God had commanded him to go. And he was passive. One of the great sins of, of, of manhood. He was passive when his daughter had been defiled by Shechem. He was passive. And he was passive when his own sons retaliated and Simeon and Levi killed the city of men in the city of Shechem. He was passive. In fact, he doesn't even mention it to the end of chapter 34. And he's more concerned about his own hide than he is anything else. That he was about the immoral actions and sins of his sons, Simeon and Levi, and destroying an entire city of men. 
when he learned to defy his defilement by Shechem, he, he seemed to do nothing. Instead, he gave that over to the, his sons, who were fiery hot mad, and they had very little clear-headedness about them. And then his own sons used the, the covenant sign that God had given them, circumcision, as a ruse, right, to get those uh, Canaanites to be in pain where they couldn't move and defend themselves. And then Simeon and Levi went and killed every man in the village. The question is, where was Jacob? Where was Jacob? He's the father. He's the patriarch. Why did Jacob not take action? Why did he not take action? It was not until his deathbed. We'll see it in Genesis chapter 49, verses 5 through 7. As Jacob is lying on his deathbed, does he finally rebuke and bring justice Simeon and Levi. You see, Jacob's failures affected the people he was charged to lead. How are your failures affecting the people you are charged to lead? Do you lead your family consistently in worship? Or do you make excuses? Do do you have family worship at your house? Do you consistently worship with God's people? Or are other things priorities? You see, these are questions that we all must before the Lord deal with. But here's the point. There's no hope in Jacob. You don't find it in this chapter. Point number two is this. There's no hope in Jacob's sons either. In chapter 34, there's no hope in Jacob's sons. You see, in this uh, era where your ancestors were venerated, their hope must not rest upon their ancestors, but rather upon the uh, promises and the faithfulness of God. And particularly, they must rest in the grand promise of God who would bless the nations of the earth through that ultimate descendant of Abraham, Jesus Christ. Now, in Genesis chapter 34, uh, there is some significant groundwork that is established here. In the, and I want to give you these principles, and I think they'll be on the screen under number two. Some important groundwork had to be established in this graphic narrative. Here's number one. We need to have a realistic rather than idealistic view of our heritage. We we need to have a realistic rather than an idealistic view of our heritage. Our forefathers were sinners. I mean, at their very best, they were sinners. Listen, there's only been one man in all of human history who had no sin, and his name is Jesus. The rest of us, we are all sinners. We are all descendants from a drunken, uh, uh, from, a, from a corrupt farmer, Adam, and a drunken sailor, Noah. We're all descended from Adam and Noah. That's how this thing works. And so we need to understand that we can't find righteousness just simply because of our ancestry. The Jews of Jesus' day said, man, we're, we're children of Abraham. And so we're righteous in the sight of God. And Jesus says, no, you're not. And one way you can know is because you want to kill the very Son of God. And if you were righteous, you would receive me and welcome me and bow at my feet and worship me and honor me. Because my Father has sent me to this world for a reason. And so we need to have a realistic rather than an idealistic view of our heritage. Number two, we need to understand that we do not inherit righteousness from our forefathers. We do not inherit righteousness from our forefathers. For one thing, you don't find much righteousness among them. Amen? And for another, the righteousness that gives us the right standing before God comes only from God himself. Romans 3.10 says that there is none righteous, no, not one. None of us, ancestors included, there is no righteousness. We need to have a realistic understanding of our family tree. And we need to understand that our righteousness does not come from our ancestors or the works that we do, but only through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then number three, we need to see that all are sinners in need of deliverance from sin through the one descendant of Abraham, 
who would bless the nations. These are truths that we find under the surface in Genesis chapter 34 that we need to understand. God is teaching us in this ancient book of Scripture that there is none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. And in this chapter, we see the flawed character of Jacob's sons. We see the flawed character of Jacob's sons. And that character had to be exposed, right, uh, in order to remove all confidence in them for deriving the blessings of God. They will never earn or deserve the blessings God intends for them in his sovereign plan of redemption. They can never be that kind of a people. And neither can we, the sons of Jacob, listen, willingly use their religion and the covenant sign given to them by God, right, uh, as a ruse toward destruction and revenge. It's like you say, hey, let's baptize a bunch of people. And we hold them under the water and kill them. All right? They misused their covenant sign, circumcision. Number two, the sons of Jacob gave no evidence of desiring God's justice or God's ways. None. They did not seek the Lord in this. They only sought to satisfy their anger. And then number three in chapter 34, the sons of Jacob pursued wholesale slaughter and satisfying their greed instead of desiring for justice to take place in what had happened to their sister, Dinah. They treated the sin of one man as if it were the sin of the whole city. And that is not justice. So the question is, would the generation that's about to enter the promised land find their confidence before God based on their heritage and the righteous acts of their forefathers? Absolutely not. And then the question for us, what are you counting on in order to have confidence before God one day? I don't know a lot. But I do know this, and this is true for every person, 7.7 billion people on planet Earth Today, I checked the world population clock just a little bit ago. 7.7 billion people on this planet. Listen to me. Every, every one of them is going to stand before the creator God of this universe one day and give an account of themselves to him and how they have rejected God in their ungodliness and unrighteousness, Romans chapter 1. We all need confidence when we stand before God, and there is only one remedy for all of our treacherous hearts in the entire world, and that is the grace of God we receive through faith in Jesus Christ. And so there's no hope in Jacob, and there's no hope in Jacob's sons. We see that in chapter 34. In fact, the Old Testament itself as a unit is pointing. There's got to be hope. You people need hope, and you ain't got no hope. I mean, the best you got is filthy rags. That's Isaiah 64, right? That's what he says, and it's true. The best we have are filthy, leprous, rotting rags before our holy God so there's no hope in Jacob and there's no hope in Jacob's sons then where is our hope what hope do we have well if you listen at all when we sing here you know where our hope is if you listen when we preach you know where our hope is there is hope number three in Christ there is hope in Christ the generation heading into the promised land at the end of Moses's leadership and the beginning of Joshua's leadership needed to understand that their hope did not rest in their heritage, but their hope rested in God. You see, the sons of Jacob failed to see their place in God's plan, and they failed to recognize God's promise to their father, to their grandfather, and to their great-grandfather. Instead of learning, now listen to this carefully, instead of learning from their fathers who despite their failures relied on the Lord in desperate times. 
the, these sons of Jacob had a little God in their minds rather than the living God in their heart. They had a God of their own making that they were worshiping. And whenever you and I do that, that God that we create looks a whole lot like ourselves. Every time. Every time. The sons of Jacob had a little God in their minds rather than the living God in their hearts. Listen, how easy it is for those so near the blessings of God to presume their actions and ideas to be okay with God when they're really far, far, far away from what God desires of us. You see, to be a part of a covenant family like Crawford Baptist Church can be a dangerous thing because, as it says in Hebrews 6, we we experience the Holy Spirit here. As we worship, as we're in in our community groups, as we sing, as we study God's Word, as we minister to one another, as we pray, as we've done in this worship service, as we prayed Thursday night in our special night of prayer, which was phenomenally wonderful. As we prayed Wednesday night in our prayer meeting gathering we have every week, it was phenomenal. And, And so we experience God, we experience the Holy Spirit in these moments, and that can be very dangerous because to whom much is given, much is required. And it's easy to become hardened and desensitized to the things of God as we carelessly handle the things of God. The sons of Jacob did not look promising as covenant representatives. Now, truthfully, neither do I. Neither do you. So we're not like just trashing them really badly. We're in the same sandals they're in to keep it real. The sons of Jacob did not look promising as covenant representatives. They were to be, right, the torch bearers. They were were to carry the, the torch of God's covenant. That's who these sons were to be. They were to be the torch carriers, the torch bearers of God's covenant with his people when Jacob died. And how unreliable they were. I mean, Simeon and Levi were, were, were only the start of the unraveling of Jacob's sons. We're going to see more and more as we keep reading. It doesn't get better. It gets worse. And here's the point. If you've heard nothing today, but I want you to hear this. Here's the point. It's not the sons of Jacob that maintain the covenant of grace. It is not the sons of Jacob who maintain the covenant of grace. Rather, it is God who maintains this covenant that he makes with his people. You see, a few weeks ago in a community group, if you were in the Gospel Project, you studied the new covenant, Jeremiah 31. And that new covenant, you see, is the law that God writes on our hearts. It's the, it's the covenant that enables you and me to have intimate knowledge of who God is. It, it, it's, a, it's a covenant whose promises are eternal. Forgiveness is eternal in the new covenant. And when you think about Hebrews 7 for a moment, Hebrews 7, 22, the Bible says this makes Jesus, the guarantor of a better covenant. Amen. Hebrews 7, 22. You see, you see, it's not the sons of Jacob having to maintain this covenant of grace. We can't maintain the covenant of grace. God maintains the covenant of grace that he makes with you in his grace. You see, salvation is initiated by grace. It is maintained by grace, which is His grace. The verses we learned for this week, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for you have been saved, right, by grace through faith, and it's not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Those are the verses that we as a faith family were memorizing from last week to this week. Those are the verses you've etched upon your heart by God's grace this week. It's what we as parents have taught our children this week. You say, no, I didn't teach my kids that this week. And remember how we ended the first point? We said, where is Jacob? Let me ask you, where are you? Why didn't you teach your children Ephesians 2, 8, 9 this week? 
Why didn't you have family worship? Why didn't you lead them to worship this week? Drop them off and hit Walmart while they're at GAs and RAs. You're teaching way more than you know. And one day, parent, you will be eternally sorry for that. Listen, men, there's some men in this room on Wednesday night. You are dead tired. You say you're tired. You say, I'm getting older and I just can't keep it up. Listen to me. You need to get your little self up off that couch and out of that recliner chair and get your blessed self in here to prayer meet with me. Or go up to the young adult group and study the book of Romans with them. You ought, to do, you ought to be ashamed of yourself for laying home, feeling sorry for yourself, thinking you're tired than anybody else in the world. Listen, get up off your blessed assurance and worship God. Men, lead your family. Th- this generation, we have passive, wimpy men. We're not godly. We're outnumbered by the women who knows what to one. Men, listen, this book is about you. It's about headship. It's about taking responsibility. And there's a ton of us men in this room. And when it comes to everything else, sports and hunting and anything else, you're taking the lead in that. You lead out with your kid. You teach them this. You teach them that. But when it comes to leading in prayer in the home, you are nowhere to be found. Wednesday night church. You mean y'all even meet on Wednesday night? Are you kidding me? Brothers and sisters, absolutely I'm kidding you. Now, I'm not being legalistic about this. I'm just saying, hey, when your heart's right, you're going to want to be with the people of God. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's how it is. But we make excuses. I'm too busy. I'm too tired. I went to the ballpark five nights a week. How can I go to church on Wednesday or Sunday? Bless your heart. There's a reckoning coming one day, beloved. I'm going to tell you what. There's a reckoning coming one day. And there's going to be a reckoning before that day. Because when kids are taught that that's more important than this, listen to me. They take that and run with that. you got, like I said, that one foot in the church and one foot in the world, and you kind of got more weight on the foot in the world than in the church. Listen to me. Your kids probably won't be in church in five years. They won't be. Hey, it's time to stop, as I said last week, playing around with God like he's just, you know, he's that paternal grandfather in the sky, and he's going to love me no matter what I do. Listen, God has a standard of holiness, and hey, we are not living up to it, even in the graces of God and in and, and the power of the Holy Spirit. We are, we are rejecting God's word. We are rebelling against his authority by not being faithful to worship God in our homes and not leading our families to worship with the community of saints at the church houses. That's a disease and a disgrace in our nation today. We make all kinds of excuses about it, and I believe God is not pleased with it. Now, Jesus, thank God, is the guarantor of a better covenant. Hebrews 7.25, listen to this. Hebrews 7.25, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those that... Those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Thank God for that. He always lives to make intercession for you and me. Listen, he who offered himself in a bloody death on our behalf on the cross is the mediator of a new covenant. And the new covenant produces spirit-wrought change in our lives. Listen, our confidence does not rest in the accomplishments of Jacob's sons, but in the faithful promise and work of Jesus Christ. Only a God-sized work of grace could bring hope to Jacob's family and the rest of the world. Only a God-sized work of grace. You see, scheming Lying and murderous men have nothing to commend themselves to God. Nor do gossips, liars, warriors, slanderers, cheats, and a host of other sins that could be named among us. We count on the grace of God as our confidence 
before him. You see, the Old Testament points to the Messiah, to Jesus. Only God's grace can prevail over our treacherous hearts. There is no hope in Jacob. There is no hope in Jacob's sons. But there is hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is God's remedy for my treacherous heart. Because in everything I have preached today, I fall short. I am not perfect with God time. I am not perfect with gather time. My mind can wander just like yours while we're singing. Sometimes my mind wanders while I'm preaching. That's a problem. But it's the truth. What I'm trying to say is we're all the same. It's not my ancestry.com is going to get me in. My ancestry dooms me. It's not that I can earn righteousness. I can't inherit righteousness from my forefathers. They had none of their own. What they had was an alien righteousness imputed to them because they have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And apart from him, there was no hope in them. But what I am saying this morning is there is good news for us all We not only sing about hope, there is hope. This Bible proclaims a never-ending hope in the person and life and work of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that there is good news for everybody in this room. And if I am a Christian, and I'm a Christian, I just struggle with things. I do. We always say around here, it's okay not to be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. Amen? See, when I find a Christian man or woman who says, you know, everything is fine, no problems, bank account's up, blood pressure's down, I'm good with the Lord, that smug attitude. In fact, he called me today asking me a little counsel. (laughs) Well, I know better than that because the book says that uh, he didn't ask anybody for advice. See, when I see a man say, you know, I, I am struggling at being a godly dad. I'm struggling at being a godly husband. I'm struggling at being a godly man. Sometimes I wonder if I'm really saved or not. I say, hey, now that brother, he's walking with Jesus. Men, there's good news for you and me today. I know I addressed us men a little bit. We men need to be addressed some. see in way too many churches the men just sit back passively and it all gets done by the ladies they bring the kids to this and they take the kids to that the man's out doing his thing beating his chest hunting bawling nothing wrong with hunting or bawling all for that but don't neglect your spiritual responsibility to your children that's what I'm saying but here's the thing There is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible says, but God shows his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that if we will confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, right, then you know, if we'll confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. For everyone who will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The gospel is good news. That the just and gracious God of the universe looked upon hopelessly sinful people and he still sent his only son Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, to bear his wrath against our sin, my sin, your sin, 
and to show his power over our sin by resurrecting Jesus' dead corpse from the grave so that everyone who will turn from their sin, that's repentance, and believe in Christ, that is faith, they will be reconciled to God forever. That is good news any day of the week. And I love you. And I want to always preach the truth to you. I will give an account one day. We all will give an account one day. I for how I preach it, you for how you receive it and respond to it. And so I love you and I pray God's blessing of grace on each one of you today. Would you pray with me?